All right, beautiful souls. So let's get into the journey. As I said, I wrote a book. It's called Antidote to Anti-Dope. You can find it on Amazon. Um, it was my first creation, so it didn't come out like, you know, it's trial and error. So when you look it up on Amazon, you need to type in antidote without the two and then antidote. But we're going to get into this because <laughs> when I was homeless, when me and my partner were homeless, uh, we, we learned a lot. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. And as I was writing it, before it was even published, I would cry and I was so angry and I was so upset because there were feelings in me that I blocked out for years and I didn't know, understand how to cope or understand why things were happening to me. Uh, in actuality, come to find out, the magical thing about it is, is they weren't happening to me, they were happening for me. And you'll learn. All right, so, and by the way, my favorite colors in the world are purple, pink, and blue. So, yeah, I've always been into, like, the purples, blues, and the pinks. Like, when the sky, like, as the sun is rising, or, yeah, you see how the, the shades, the different blues and pinks and purples are in the sky. I look at that as an omen because my father, God rest his soul, you know, he's passed away and I have a brother that's passed away and yeah, I have loved ones, you know, that are passed away and it just gives me hope and I know that they're watching over me. Guys, there are so many things you're going to learn as we go. So... It says, Antidote to Anti-Dope, A Woman's Journey to the Light at the End of the Tunnel. And I have a table of contents, uh, 55 chapters. Y'all, this has been a journey. Alright, so the introduction goes like this. I have a purpose, we all do. It took me 37 years to finally realize my purpose on this earth. In this book, I share with you the trials and tribulations I have been through. The goal is to help you learn from my mistakes, because I don't want you to have to go through it if I can help you. <clears throat> Make the right decisions and avoid repeating the same mistakes that I have made in the past. Life is short and tomorrow is not promised. Some of the things you're about to read may appear hard to believe. It takes my present journey to understand. I'm a living testimony. I have the conviction that things can get better. They will. I'm desperate to share my story with you guys. The things that have occurred in my life were all a part of the divine plan. My life's journey will inspire everyone, irrespective of race, color, or status. It's my hope it helps heal the broken and spread the love that is needed for humanity as a whole to become better. This book is for the black sheep, outcasts, drug addicts, alcoholics, molested, prostitutes, and kids growing up in foster care, homeless, non-believers, hypocrites, but most of all, the people who are and always will be defined by their past. And it's cool because I can go back now and edit the way that I was thinking because it says here, but most of all, the people who are and always will be defined by their past. Y'all... Once you get healed and you're on your journey, you won't always be defined by your past. You get to recreate who you are authentically. The truth comes out. You begin to walk, sleep, breathe, talk. Who you truly are, you know, and the world gets to see it. Um, and will be defined by their past. All right. That's just the introduction. All right, been there. And it says that I've been there because, um, guys, I'm not the only one that has gone through the, these trials. Um, but I will say that um, I was chosen to speak up and to tell my story because there are a lot of us out here that are afraid. And they have no voice and they feel like they are alone. You're not alone, you know. You just have to wake up. And I'm going to get you there. It says, been there, I've done it. I don't feel any shame about it. You'll get to this point too. 
and I'm not judgmental. Most importantly, this book is written for my two children, and I may not be able to tell you the truth, but at least you will be able to read it. I love you too dearly, and I truly apologize from the depths of my heart for not being the mother you two needed. Just know that I love you. Until we meet again. Guys, you're going to be heartbroken, especially if you've had kids uh, removed from your life. Uh, but you have to remember that you're coming from trauma, more than likely. And um, my goal is to become the mother that I never had, so that I can be the best version of myself and the best mother for both my kids, you know? And this journey, it's I have become that and you guys get to witness it all right it says uh until we meet again god's blessed us with an, an amazing world sadly however a lot of us are taking it for granted we need to remember where we come from because when it's over it's really just begun i want to make it through these gates you deserve to make it through those gates too <coughs> guys we all want to make it to heaven, you know, but while you're here, you can create heaven on earth. Trust me, you really can. Um, there are just lessons and things that we have to go through to get there. All right, so this is chapter one. Just come along with me on my journey. It gets good. It gets sad. It gets You'll get angry, but it gets good. <clears throat> it says, My name is Nargisan El Malezi, but everyone calls me Narsi. Growing up, I couldn't pronounce my real name, so I made up Narsi. My father bought me a plant when I was a child and told me that I was named after it. It was an Egyptian white flower. To me, it held an awful odor. To me, I was younger, you know, it stunk. Truly, I wasn't happy about it, but now that I'm older, I've learned to love it. Guys, when we're younger, we still have a lot to learn, okay? Um, okay, one of my biggest faults in life was the urge to please people. I'm not the only one. I'm sure you do, too, or that was one of your faults. To please people. As long as everyone around me was happy, I thought I was. I was born on October 7th, 1985, in Raleigh, North Carolina, at Duke Hospital in Durham County. Um, I'm a Libra. My father was. May his soul rest in the... <laughs> rest in peace. I gotta correct. There are some edits that I gotta make in this book, but I'm currently working on my second one, and, you know, it's gonna be amazing. May his soul rest in peace. Um, my father is from Mansoura, Egypt. My father grew up poor, helping his mother, his brothers, and his sisters. His father died early in his life. He had three brothers and... Let me flip the page. Okay. And sisters. And three sisters. He was a twin, but his twin sister died at birth. My father had always been the funniest person that ever existed in my life. Whenever he entered a room, he automatically lit the entire room up. My father was a god to me. I adored my father. He was my hero, you know? My father came to the United States when he was 23 years old. Before his departure, his mother packed the suitcases. He was definitely a mama's boy. My father had a favorite soup called Mulchaya. It is the national dish of Egypt. It's made by cooking a large amount of finely chopped jute, which is a green leaf vegetable with a distinctively bitter flavor. Now, if you season it really good, it's really, really good. Um, all right. My father's mother was determined to make her make sure her son had plenty of it, so she cooked it and packed it, packed ten bags of it, in sealed freezer bags and packed it in a suitcase. When my father arrived at the airport in the United States, he was quickly detained in a waiting room until the guards searched his entire luggage. Four hours later, they found out it wasn't marijuana. All right, y'all. These were the book bags filled with green leafy stuff, okay? <laughs> yeah, so the security thought it was pot. 
It wasn't pot. This is a story I'll never forget. It makes me laugh every time I think about it. Um, <clears throat> four hours later, they found out it wasn't marijuana, but a soup from Egypt. At this time, my father couldn't speak English, so this poor guy was panicking. My father has always been really thin and just, you know, scrawny. God bless him, you know, but so adorable. Um, mind you, he knew no English. So he's probably panicking, like, what the hell is going on here? Take me back to Egypt. <laughs> Anyways. <clears throat> so this poor guy was panicking, a sight I would have loved to see. I laugh every time I think about it. My father studied and devoted his life to his work and his family the best way he could. The first job my father got in the USA was as a bartender, I learned about this many years later. Growing up, my father was anti-alcohol, so finding this out was a surprise to me. You know, growing up in a Muslim family home, or any cons modest, you know, conservative home, you your standards are higher. Like, doing drugs and alcohol and wearing short shorts, daisy dukes, uh, tank tops, showing your cleavage, you know, dating boys, uh, sex before marriage. That's just not, it's not allowed in your home. It's just not, you know? And let's continue to read. So yeah, when I found out years later that my father, in fact, was a bartender, and uh, that's how he met my biological mother, I was just like, ugh, we're not so different after all, are we? But my father wanted more for us, you know? He really did. He didn't want us to follow in his footsteps and make the same mistakes, uh that he made and um it's the same way with our kids too we don't want them to make the mistakes that we made because we know how badly it hurt and we know that there is a better way right so my father met my mother in north carolina while he was studying from what i can remember she was a free spirit american white woman who came from a broken home my father wanted better for her, so he encouraged her to get her GED. He helped tutor her. My mother and father ended up getting married, and they gave birth to little Elmo. I'm not going to put real names in it, because I'm not trying to call anyone out. But yeah, my father and mother gave birth to little Elmo, my elder brother. I was born shortly after. We were only a year apart. Um... Right after I was born, my father decided to relocate us to Auburn, Alabama. My father ended up completing school and became a professor of textiles at Auburn University. It's one of the most profound colleges in the USA and well known for college football. Man, we didn't miss a football game and we tailgated outside of uh, my father's office in downtown Auburn on Tumor's Corner almost every game, unless we got in trouble and we couldn't go. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, my father was always at work studying and traveling on business trips. If I recall, my brother and I spent a lot of time with my mother up until we were three and four years old. My mother had a lot of friends and we were always around them while my father was working to provide for us. There's not much I can remember during these few years we lived with my mother. And I'm going to go a little deeper with this because, y'all... When you grow up in dysfunction and toxicity, you know, yeah, my mom, my biological mother was a free spirit, but she had us around a lot of people that were not good. Um, and a, a lot of things, we were, you know, you think you're supposed to be protected by your mother. We weren't protected. We were put in a lot of harm, you know? And I learned this literally 37 years later. <laughs> she didn't protect us. Um, and you're soon to learn. It's, it's sad that I don't cry about it anymore. I'm stronger for it, you know? And then I go on to say, My mother had a lot of friends and we were always around them while my father was working to provide for us. There's not much I can remember during the few years we lived with my mother. I blocked a lot of things out. Um, 
My first encounter as a child being molested was by a white older male from my mother's side of the family. All I can remember was sitting on a riding lawnmower riding around the yard for hours as this man abused me sexually. Y'all, I've come a long way because as I was writing this, I knew that I had to get this information out on paper so that I could understand it. I literally cried the whole entire time, but I'm, I'm like, it doesn't make me sad anymore. I, I have a better understanding, and you'll see. Okay, my all I can remember was sitting on a riding lawnmower. I believe it was my mother's father, or maybe brother. It was one of the others, but I remember him being older, so it was probably her father. Um, my father was probably oblivious about this incident. He was always consumed with his work. I have questions I know I will never get true answers. Growing up, I was told my mother was on drugs and alcohol. I go on in this book because I had a couple conversations with my biological mother but I don't know whether or not to trust it. And as time went on throughout this journey, I've learned not to. Uh, I've learned that she honestly is not mentally stable. But as I was talking to her for those couple of conversations, she was the only one throughout this journey that would talk to me. But she wasn't too concerned about me or my well-being. She was more concerned about my boyfriend and about how my father died. And, um... What inheritance did my brother get? And I just didn't understand it, you know. But we'll get more into this. You know, she didn't really care too much to see how I was doing. And I was homeless and broke down, yada, 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 yada. So, but at this time when I was writing this, I felt a little bit of a connection because everyone else in my family disconnected me at one of, one of my lowest times in my life. And she was the only one that I can talk to or that would even answer my phone call. So, um, it says, growing up, I was told my mother was on drugs and alcohol. I didn't know I would find out the truth, find the truth out 37 years later. My parents ended up losing custody of us. Things were unstable. My brother ended up drinking out of a Coke can, which had a cigarette butts and ashes. This made him sick, and the Department of Children's Services got involved. There was a lot more abuse than that. But, yeah, in the beginning of this journey, as I was writing, this is all I knew. But I learned a lot more uh, the, the more healed I became. <clears throat> this made him sick, and then the DHR got involved. My father fought with the state and regained custody of both my brother and me. During this fight to regain custody, we were placed in foster care. My second encounter with child molestation occurred in foster care. Guys, it is important that I talk about this. Because there are so many kids in our generation right now. Uh, in 2023, we're going to 2024 that have been molested that at the ages of 9, 10, 11, they are committing suicide. They are getting bullied. Nobody is standing up for them. Nobody has their back. They feel alone. They feel unseen. They feel unheard. Okay, guys? <sighs> We have to bring awareness to this and we have got to become more comfortable talking about the things that have happened to us so that our kids and their kids can talk about it. And it doesn't end up in suicide because we're losing a lot of children, you know. They have no one to talk to. So yes, I am coming out here and I am talking about it. It has happened to me many times in my life and I pushed it to the side. Because I didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't know how to cope with it. I thought it was normal. After a while, it kept happening, you know? So, yes, talk about it. It says, my second encounter with child molestation occurred in foster care. My mother didn't have a chance against... My mother did not have a chance against a professor at Auburn University um, in getting regaining custody. And honestly, uh, I've learned that she really didn't put too much of an effort. Um, later on down the road, this is what I learned. Um, but the book, as I was healing, I'm going to read it verbatim. My mother didn't have a chance against a professor at Auburn University. And really, this is truth, y'all. And it sucks because there's so much injustice and corruption that is going on in our states, in our world, because 
judges are not following their oaths. They are biased. If you have money, they will listen to you. They will have your back. If you don't have money, if you are, and I hate to say this, I am from Alabama. They are so biased and there is so much racism there, you know? But it says, my mother didn't have a chance against a professor at Auburn University. When she realized she wasn't getting his back, she went into shock and was admit admitted into a hospital. My father alienated her from us and kept us away from her. Later on, did I find out it was for our protection? Um, I knew he thought it was the right thing to do at this point in my life. I had no clue what was going on. I was just a baby. My father was still consumed by his studies and work, so my brother and I barely got to see him. All right. Oops. <clears throat> Guys, I vape. Okay? I'm going to be real. I like, I vape. <laughs> I smoke cigarettes too, but I want to teach y'all some things. So, I'm going to stick it out. Plus, cigarettes are not good for you. Um, all right. I got to have a conversation with my biological mother 23 years later, and she told me she was never on drugs or alcohol and that my father got abusive, married her for the green card, and wouldn't let her see us. My mom said every holiday she drew, drove by our house with hopes that we would be looking out the window and see her. Guys, I used to bawl when I first started writing this uh, book but I feel so good about sharing it now. And I'm not sad about it. My mom said, okay, she said that she would dress me up in Cabbage Patch dolls and swaddle me as a baby, and she would lay me down in one of the dresser drawers right next to her beds, stating that if I made a, as little as a peep, she would be right there by my side to make sure I was fine. I know both of my parents loved us. They were just two opposites with different opinions and perspectives about things. They were from two different continents, you know, were brought up two different ways, you know, and it clashed coming together, you know, and just, it just clashes. During this time, my father was my best, what, my father was my best friend's no, my father was best friends with this Egyptian family. We would call the mother auntie, the father uncle, their daughter big sis, and her son big bro. Auntie became somewhat of a mother figure for us. The family was the only family around when my father and my mother were still married. The true definition of family was a love and sense of belonging they shared with my brother and me. Honestly, this, these, this family... Uh, really knew how to love us and show us what a family what we wish our family was like you know but things happen for a reason um aunt became my father's auntie became my father's go-to when it came to babysitting us while he worked and studied which was all the time my, my father made sure to buy me the biggest jar of peanut butter from the store every morning before he dropped us off at auntie's house Peanut butter was my absolute favorite food ever. I love peanut butter. As long as I had peanut butter, I was set. During this time, both my brother and I probably were four and five. This family remained our family since we were born. However, because of unfortunate circumstances, which you will learn later on, we lost contact. This would be the last time I honestly felt genuinely loved and safe as a child. I miss this family to this day with all my heart. But like I said, everything happens for a reason. Um, I was a cute little talkative. And when I say talkative, I mean I would talk anyone's head off about things a child my age shouldn't know or talk about. I'm sure a lot of us were that way. I remember getting in trouble a lot. I had the nickname Nosy Nara because I entered adults' conversation. I had conversations I had no business entering or that's how they made me feel. Now that I'm working on my healing and growing, you know, you don't call a child nosy Nara, you know. No one really took the time to teach me how to, as a child, how to respect adults' conversations. Nobody really 
heard me as a child. My opinion on things and matters and situations, it didn't matter to anybody. And I'm learning this now. So in this book, as I said, this is my first book I wrote. I was hard on myself, you know? But now I have a better understanding, you know? I was a child and I wasn't raised with the knowledge that I needed, you know? It's crazy. Um, yeah, I got a lot of work to do in my second book. But it says, but I wasn't taught differently. I didn't understand boundaries. I know my brother and I blocked out a ton because the shit we lived through being so innocent and young, no kid should ever have to experience it. My brother and I had fun with each other sexually all the time. Okay, this is where it was kind of like I got kind of stuck. Well, it was hard for me to explain this. But growing up, my brother and I, and I'm sh I know I'm not the only one, um... We humped each other. Um, and it's because I saw my biological mother with her partners or even with my father humping each other. It's just, you know, they didn't really respect us and just our, it was kind of like we were robbed of our, it is, we were robbed of our childhood and our innocence. So, uh, we explored with one another and uh, I explored with, um, I can talk about this now, but I explored with, uh, my brother that's passed away's best friend. And my cousin from Egypt explored with my brother that passed away in our shed when we used to live at, on East University. Um, when they came to visit from Egypt, uh, a lot of this happens. And I'm not the only one that this happens to, you know. I just have the courage to talk about it. Um, but yeah, we, we sexually, there was a lot of humping and a lot of, you know. We were children. Um, but yeah. Okay. Let's carry on. We had seen something growing up and weren't told it was inappropriate for children our age to practice. We thought it was normal and it continued until we were 15 and 16. It is, you know, we just... Yeah. I had long, straight, dark brown hair that grew to my knees with the prettiest hazel eyes that people still compliment to this day. I remember Auntie having to cut my hair off one afternoon because I had lice. One thing she used to always do was play with my hair, and it felt so good. I felt relaxed about the experience, and sometimes I would fall asleep. Auntie was upset, but she had to chop it off. Because I had all this beautiful hair and, you know, my father working, studying to become the professor that he did. Um, he didn't really maintain or help. Really, you know, hygiene was not priority. Uh, so, yeah, I got lice. And she had to cut all my hair off. And she cried and I cried. And I was, ah, you know? But, yeah. My it says, my brother and I could have been taken care of better. Whenever Auntie got us, we were dirty and she would have to save the day and clean us up. They truly adored my brother and me. We also adored them. His family was the only one I knew. I could get real answers to questions I had about my biological mother growing up. I think everyone just tried to protect my brother and me. But sometimes it just really felt like they were trying to protect my father's name. I would always go to the lake with my dad, my brother, and this family. And then I narrated, a uh, narrator inserted a lot in this book. It was me, because I would think of something, and then I would want to add it, because, you know, we need details and we need truth. Um, it says, it makes a difference when you're sober about the things you can recall about your childhood. God has led me on this journey, and I'm eternally grateful. Being homeless on these streets in Austin, Texas, has opened my eyes to the true meaning of living. What's the essence of living when you're not really living? And that, that, I still, you know, because we weren't living back home in Alabama, and even as a childhood, I wasn't, as a child, I, I wasn't given the chance to be a child and live, you know? But yeah, these little inserts that I put in the book were inserted, uh, 
because I was writing in my tent with a little flashlight, or, you know, trying to remember my past traumas so that I could heal. Because I, I, my heart, my soul desired it so much. I needed healing. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Um, and then it goes on to say, I remain grateful to God. I'm finally living. Uh, I get tired and then able to rest, but the positive outweighs the negatives. It brings tears to my eyes when I remember that after all the drug use and alcohol abuse I put myself through for 13 years, I'm finally free. Now I have peace and contentment in my heart. It leaves my soul content regardless of the pain in my, in my past. I need my reader to learn from this. Guys, it may take you 10, 15, 20 years uh, for you to get to that point, you know, but you will soon enough, you will see the progress that you're making and nobody around you matters because you know in your heart and your soul that you're well-deserving, you're valuable, and the world needs you. I'm going to get you there, okay? <clears throat> Let me cut this sh uh, video off. It's already gone into 31 minutes. And I gotta use the bathroom, but I'm excited to continue. God bless you. I'll get back on here in a minute.